uh, open up, shall we? Sounds good. All right. Welcome to Book Talk. I'm Winston. I like to read good books, and you should too. Today, I uh, have a very special guest. Charles Embry Jr. Uh, is with me. We're going to talk about his books. So um, why don't you uh, show off? You've got three books in the series. What's the name of the series? I do. Well, first off, Winston, yeah. I want to tell you how much I appreciate you having me here. Um, I've got a series I call the, it's the Grey Realm Adventures. Okay. And the first book is The Lost Keep. And uh, I had, uh, yep. you have that. Yeah. And I had uh, Larry I Elmore do did my, did my uh, <laughs> forward and cover for me. And the second one in the series is Beyond the Black River Sticks. Yep. And the third one I'm is out of hands. Eternal Midnight. <laughs> <laughs> of if you yeah. come up with another one, I would know you're yeah. in. So anyway. Right. But um, they're um, standalone adventures. Okay. Uh, I, when I started um, writing, I started writing with a D&D background. Okay. I was a dungeon master. And my first book is based on a dungeon I actually wrote back in the um, early 80s. Okay. And so, just like a good D&D adventure, some characters move on, mm -hmm. some perish, mm -hmm. and but the quest and stories continue. So, you can actually pick up the third book, and it's a little richer if you've read the other two, but the story will stand alone. Okay, so why don't you give me a bird's eye view of the uh, what, what's going on in the series? Just Well, uh, the Lost, the lost yeah. Key was... Uh, in the dungeon I'd written, it was okay. a time dungeon, and I, uh, all my characters were gathered in a tavern. <laughs> as you do? As you do. And they heard of an ancient legend okay. of a land far to the north where uh, a king had been cursed because he had offended the gods of Olympus. And his, the, the outlying keep had ban been banished into the mist of time and would only reappear for one day every 100 years. And, which is all fine and good, except for his daughter's trapped inside. Right. And so. he's not, he's not exactly happy over that. But so the only enter, way- enter the heroes. Huh? The only, enter the heroes. The yeah. only way to, uh, the only way to save his daughter is to break the curse Excellent. during that one day period. That's the Lost Keep. That's the Lost uh, Keep. Beyond the River Styx follows direct, or beyond, excuse me, beyond the Black River Styx. Yes. Sorry. Um, follows directly on from that, uh, and that takes things in a little different direction. What's uh... I, I went a little darker. Okay. Um, you know, my hero's coming of age. Sure. And because he started out at seven becoming a paladin and now he's gotten through his first adventure and he's coming of age and and tragedy has struck and he's got to make choices mm -hmm. um because you know like any young man does he's got to choose between his heart mm -hmm. and his loyalty to himself and what he is mm -hmm. and as a paladin that's an incredible burden on your shoulders mm -hmm. And um, so he's got to, it's sort of a coming of age for him. And the adventure that he's got to partake in is, um, is very much of a discovery mm -hmm. of himself and what he's capable of. So he, he journeys yeah. across the sticks. Yeah. It's uh, all the best uh, tradition of Greek mythology you got going on there. It's, it's very, very powerful stuff. And well, then, Greek mythology was great because everybody has a little bit of a background in it. Right. So you're familiar with these stories. Right. Only I mold them a little bit. And everything comes to a big climactic uh, head in the last one, which is... Eternal Midnight. Eternal Midnight. Um, Eternal Midnight is... Oh, it was tough for me because I knew I was closing out the series. Okay. And I had actually grown to love these characters and who they were. And I, uh, I wanted to finish their story in a powerful, epic way um, where a, uh, an anti-paladin is born. Mm. And he's a mirror image of my paladin hero. Yeah. 
And what more deadly adversary could there be? Right. But through dark magic, he becomes even more deadly. Yeah. So threatening, threatening that eternal man. It's good stuff. We're not going to give him away. Or we're not going to give away the, uh, the the story. Actually, right now but, we're giving uh, away the first book. Well, you know, they, I don't he, think anybody really expects the hero to die. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, I, I guess that could happen, but nobody really. Uh, <laughs> I don't consider that a spoiler. <laughs> But the ebook's on Amazon right now today. So. That's right. Part of the reason we're doing that today, he's got an event going on. Go to Amazon, get the Lost Keep for free today. If you're watching this in the future, get it anyway. All right. So, uh, who's your favorite character in the series? You've got a lot of good ones. You know, it's it's tough. It's tough. Um, you know, Clovis, the the young paladin. Yep. I had fun writing him because I had to think back to what it was like to be you know, <laughs> 17, 18 years old and some of the ways your brain will work. Warhawk, his mentor, yeah. was uh, more of a seasoned veteran. He was, you know, a little more of the uh, thoughtful, planning, mm -hmm. calculating general over the impetuous young warrior wanting to charge in and <laughs> slay all evil in sight. Um, it's, it's hard between those two. I really, um, uh, I really liked them both for different reasons. Yeah. I, uh, I, I, I gotta agree with you. I lean towards Warhawk, uh, myself, but actually I find myself out of the whole series, uh, Clovis' father. He's the one that, uh, the, that I really latched onto. I said, you know what? I like this guy. He, he's the, he's the real hero, <laughs> but um, so that uh, uh, lots of good stuff going on in all three of these. Was there a particular scene that you enjoyed writing, or some piece of the world that you really enjoyed creating? Yeah, there was. Um, I enjoyed working with the Greek mythology mm -hmm. a lot because I could work with Olympus and the the surface world. Um, so I did enjoy creating that world and, and molding that mythology to fit the theme of the, of the book. Mm -hmm. um, my wife and I were actually just talking about that uh, today, and we both kind of agreed. One of my favorite things to write was the, uh, the introduction of my ranger. Okay. And um, how she came into play. Okay. And I, you know, I wanted her to be a powerful character. Mm -hmm. And I wanted her to show that, you know, yeah, she's a girl, but, well, she's an elf, but still, <laughs> she's, she's a powerful character. Yeah. And she, um, she doesn't take any, she doesn't take anything off anybody. You know, she'll, she'll hang in there. But then she also has her own feelings and, mm -hmm. and you know, her own confusion about how she should proceed. Mm -hmm. um, the other scene that I really, really liked writing was a, a battle between uh, my hero and a dragon. Mm -hmm. And it, you know, an insurmountable odds and what came out through him, through his, through his anger, through his desire to, to do this. Right. Um, you know, he, he achieved the impossible. And, uh, you know, it was, it was a, a, a fun thing to write. I, uh, I enjoyed that. It was, it was fairly powerful. Nice. Uh, let's see, what else? So, you wrote these, let's talk about the audience for a minute. Um, you wrote these specifically for the young adult audience. Who did you have in mind? My grandchildren. When um, I started writing, I wasn't even planning on being published at all. Right. I just, you know, I enjoyed playing the game so much, Dungeons and yeah. Dragons, when I was, I was a young airman down at Keesler Air Force Base. And it was, you know, we could buy a couple pizzas and throw dice all weekend. Well, and yeah. it's a good, cheap way to enjoy the weekend and, and stay out of trouble. 
but I knew that my grandkids, I couldn't really get them to sit down and play because we're in different parts of the country and things like that. Right. But I wanted them to feel what it was like to be in one of my games. Because as a dungeon master, I wove a story. Yeah. I mean, it was, it was driven so much by the dungeon master in the early days, and we enjoyed writing our own stuff. And so I wanted them to experience what it was like to be in one of my dungeons mm -hmm. without having to learn how to play the game. So I basically took characters that we had used mm -hmm. and made it in novel form. Legit? I mean... So it's, it's good for anybody junior high and up, mm -hmm. or even maybe fifth or sixth grade, depending on your reading level. But there's nothing inappropriate, inappropriate about it for anyone. Sure. Well, I, that's one of the things I really appreciated about it, um, that, that these are books that, uh, that I can share with my nephews. You know, uh, you know, my kids aren't going to read them, but I might. <laughs> but, you know, the nephews might. So uh, tell me a little bit about, about some of your writing influences. Um, you mentioned, you know, this grew out of D&D &D and out of uh, being a dungeon master. So, I mean, obviously, you know, the, uh, the early probably the early adventure modules keep on the borderlands and uh, a little bit you know but like i said we we did some of those but we wrote a lot of our own things mm -hmm. and you know i didn't know if i could write or not but i just figured i'd tell the story and put it on paper right and it actually it actually worked and i was i was pleased with that uh, so my writing style is very unorthodox and I don't, I, I don't think you could read my, my stuff and say, oh, he sounds like so-and-so or sure. he's got this style. Um, because I'm, I'm ashamed to say I'm not a big reader myself. And, <laughs> and that's, that's I, I'm embarrassed, but I, I'm really not. I, um, I would read as a kid, but I read a lot more science things. Mm. And, and uh, I've always been kind of a nerd. So well, you're in good company. <laughs> you know, when uh, when I would write things in the military, I was writing technical stuff, and mm -hmm. and I'd write research papers and things. But I've always loved my imagination, and they get really mad at you if you're writing a research paper and you make things up. You know, I, I have <laughs> noticed that. I have noticed that. So you said you don't read a whole lot, but you do read some. Who are some of uh, some of your favorite authors? Uh a lot of them are, are lesser known because they're authors that I've met at uh, Gen Con or some of the other small cons. Um, I really um, I really enjoyed uh, some books that were written by a friend of mine, Shane Moore. Mm -hmm. um, and he's, he's doing fairly well now with some of his series. But um, Jonathan Rutter mm -hmm. was writing a series um, and they've, they've got different styles, but, you know, good stories. Uh, Isaac Crow mm -hmm. is, uh, a guy, he, he writes more, um, anime kind of okay. stuff, but, um, uh, but I really like his work. Excellent. So you were playing D&D in the eighties, yep. early to mid eighties, like just to, fell into just it, just fell into it. So that was uh, that was second edition AD and D and yep. all that stuff. I understand that uh, you've had some interesting Gen Con uh, adventures. I have. Um, we um, we went to our first Gen Con and it was I think the third year they had Authors Avenue. Okay. And there was four or five of us there, and that's all you know as far as authors oh, go. Oh man. And uh, but you get to Gen Con. And I'd never been to a convention before. And Gen Con was an eye opener. So we go in and we set up the table and it's like, holy smokes, what is this? Yeah. And we get all set up. My wife, boy, she's in charge of all the props and everything. And, and we're all set up and ready to go. And, and uh, I was sitting there and I stayed at my booth mm -hmm. because, you know, the second you go to walk away, somebody comes up, and you don't want to miss any chances. Right. 
but my wife, on the other hand, she was enjoying Gen Con. So she was out, I'd sell a book, and she'd go, whoo-hoo, more money. And off she'd go. But she, she comes back, and she goes, get a book. And I said, oh, no. okay. And I grab one, she goes, you got to come with me. And I said, baby, I can't leave the table. And she goes, you got to come with me. So I leave with her, and we go around, and she walks up to this older guy, in an Amigo. And <laughs> I became speechless. Yeah. And she goes, uh, she goes, I was over here and I was telling Mr. Gygax about your writer. <laughs> and he said, I have to meet him. So I brought wow. him to you. And I'm sitting there and I went, oh, oh, okay. So I finally <laughs> could speak and I said, Mr. Gygax. And he goes, no, 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 call me Gary. And I, a really nice, just genuine guy. And I, I said, I'd, I'd love for you to have my book. I'd love to know what you think of it. And he said, I'd love to take it, but you have to sign it first. Yeah. Hardships. Oh, my gosh. I thought my heart was going to jump out of my chest. I said, yes, sir. And he goes, well, come on. Sit at my table with me for a little while. We'll talk. Oh. So I'm sitting there, oh. and he's signing autographs, and we're chatting about D&D. And I was in D and D heaven right there because oh, I felt man. like I was in I was with D and D, you know, royalty or or even deity for D and D, you know. <laughs> but um, he was reviewing my book, and about three months later, uh, I heard word that he passed away. Yeah. So it it broke my heart because I would have really loved to have heard what he thought. And uh, it broke my heart because, you know, D and D lost a legend. Yeah. But um, what an absolutely awesome individual. And if my wife hadn't been out spending my money, I would have never met him. <laughs> <laughs> now you had uh, uh, an introduction to Larry Elmore as well. I did. Uh, sometimes the fates smile upon you. Right. Sometimes they. <laughs> Sometimes the fates aren't very pleased, but um, I had a gentleman over in Litchfield training my horses. Mm -hmm. And um, he looked at my Facebook page and he goes, hey, you write about the stuff my uncle draws. Mm -hmm. And I said, really? And he goes, yeah, his name's Larry Elmore. <laughs> Would you like to meet him? <laughs> Would you like to meet him? <laughs> uh, yeah. So, so we get to meet Larry at Gen Con, and, and um, he's up there, and I said, hey, I, I know your nephew, uh, Tyler. And he goes, Tyler? I said, yeah. And he goes, oh, he's such a good boy. <laughs> and we just started chatting and ended up having him do two of the covers of my books. Yeah, fantastic. And he wrote the foreword for the, the first one. Mm -hmm. And just, just a down-to-earth, genuine kind of guy. Um, my son-in-law is a big D and D player, mm -hmm. and well, actually, my grandson-in-law is a huge D and D player. And he was over at the house one day, and I said, "Hey, uh, the women were all gone." I said, "Let's go get something to eat." He goes, uh -oh. "Okay." I said, <laughs> "You mind if we go over and maybe go eat with Larry Elmore?" <laughs> so we all went to a Mexican restaurant, and now I am the favorite. The favorite one in the family. Uh, yeah, well earned. <laughs> so. Well earned. That's awesome. All right. So, yeah, is there is there anything else that uh, you know special uh, special memories or anything uh, that you just really want to emphasize about your books or something something memorable on the road to writing these? You know, when I first started writing. Um, Family would look at it. Well, mm -hmm. she, my wife reluctantly looked at it because she's not a D and D player at all. And you kept uh, her anyway. I got her to watch Lord of the Rings once, and we got to the end of the first movie, and she goes, "What do you mean it's not over?" <laughs> <laughs> but you know, we, um, oh. you know, it's it's been good, and it, it's it's been a lot of fun, and I uh, I've enjoyed it. But, you know, 
it's just something that I love, mm -hmm. something I love to do, and and I love having readers. And the first, you know, family members, they'll like anything you do, you know. And and and, I, Lord knows what they're thinking inside your head, but they'll <laughs> tell you it's great. Right. It's absolutely great, which is awesome. Except it doesn't really help you a lot. Right. But we went right after the first book came out. We went to a little just a little craft show. And this young girl right across the way bought one. And uh, we were gonna be back the next day. Mm -hmm. And so early that morning we're sitting there and she comes walking in and she looked at me and she goes, I hate you. Oh no. And I went, what? <laughs> what did I do? And she said, I didn't get to go to bed till after three o'clock this morning. <laughs> she had to sit there and finish the entire first book. And I thought that was the coolest compliment ever. That's fantastic. Well, uh, we're, we're about twice as long as I usually like to go, <laughs> which, um, you know, probably could have called that going in, but <laughs> knew that was gonna happen. So what's, what is something that you really want the reader to take away from, from the reading experience? You know, I had someone ask me about an audio book, mm -hmm. and he says, can you do an audio book? And I said, you know, the whole reason I write, and, there, and I didn't even realize it when I first started doing it, but there are times we need to escape this world. Mm -hmm. You know, the pressures of daily life, just all the stuff that, that weighs down on your shoulders. Mm -hmm. And what I want is for someone to be able to pick up one of my books, mm -hmm. grab something cold to drink, kick back their feet in a recliner, and disappear from this world sure. for just a short amount of time. I want them to ride with the heroes. I want them to face dragons. I want them to, to smell the, the musty air coming out of that dark cave that they're all peering into. Nice. And that's what I want from my reader. So that's, that's one reason I haven't done an audio book. I don't want someone riding in their car going to work, yeah. listening to the story and trying to drive the car down the road because that's not what it's meant to do. It's meant to help you get out of this world for a little while. And uh, you know that's the greatest thing about our minds is I don't care. When I sat down and started writing, you know, the body hurt, mm -hmm. I'm getting older. But when I started writing, when I started telling that story, right. I was young again. And I felt like the 17 year old that was throwing the dice yeah. and, and being the dungeon master. I felt young again. And I want my readers to feel that. I want them to feel like they can defeat dragons. Yeah. I want them to feel like anything's possible because your mind can overcome all our limitations here on earth. You're, I mean, the mind's the greatest thing. It's, that's how superheroes fly, is our imagination. Chuck, you've been so gracious with your time. I really appreciate you uh, coming out to talk to me. Where can we find your books? Uh, right now, the best place to find them is on Amazon. All right. Uh, you can just look under Charles Embry uh, Jr. Okay. And it's E-M-B-R-E-Y. <laughs> um, a lot of... Uh, the, the more common spelling leaves off the second E. Sure. But um, the trilogy's on there. It's the, They're all available through um, Kindle and uh, hardcovers and paperback. That's awesome. All right. Well, you know what your assignment is? Your assignment is to go find a good book and read it. And when you come back, when you have done that, come on back because there's more book talk yet to come. Appreciate it. Thank you so much Thank for being you. here.